four, three, two, one. This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today. This hearing entitled, Renewing the United States Commitment to Addressing the Root Causes of Migration from Central America will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, strenuous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. To insert something into the record, email the document to the previously mentioned address and contact subcommittee staff. As a reminder to members, staff, and all other phys physically present in this room, for recent guidance from the Office of the According Physician, masks must be worn at all times during today's hearing. Please sanitize your seating area. The chair views these measures as a safety issue and therefore an important matter of order and decorum for this proceeding. As a reminder to members joining remotely, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with House Res 8 and the accompanying regulations, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to a eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum, and we will now rec I will now recognize myself for opening remarks. <clears throat> well, I am thrilled that we have two experienced witnesses with us to discuss how to strengthen U.S. policy and foreign assistance towards Central America. I believe our goal should be to ensure that every individual throughout Central America has the chance to achieve a life of dignity and opportunity in their home country. Only, only then will we be able to solve the challenge of irregular migration. I know from speaking with both of our witnesses that they come to this hearing with proposals for how to do this, but also eager to hear ideas from our members on what we can do better. To me, this is what the relationship between Congress and the executive branch should look like. We are here to work together on a bipartisan basis to achieve the best policy outcomes for the American people. I have been working on these issues long enough to know that success in this effort will not be achieved overnight. I will take, it will take many years of sustained effort and I applaud President Biden for sending a clear message at the start of this administration that this issue is a priority and that he and Vice President Harris are ready to invest necessary time and resources to achieve real progress. As we all know, this hearing comes at a moment when the border arrivals are once again on the rise. Our immigration system is in dire need of reform, but the purpose of today's hearing is to look south off the border at the issues that are forcing people to flee their homes. My experience from traveling many times to the region is that most individuals who make the journey know that it is dangerous. They also know that it is unlikely that they will be granted entry into the United States, but they're so desperate to escape that they, adult, that they take the costly and dangerous trip anyway. Violence, impunity, inequality, and the impact of climate change are among the many push factors driving this trend. Hurricane Eta, Iota, hit Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua extremely hard at the end of last year, impacting as many as nine million people in Central America. In San Pedro Sula alone, hundreds of thousands of people were forced into temporary shelters after their homes were flooded. This devastation is, closely, is clearly contributing to the current wave of migration, and I welcome USAID's announcement last week that it has deployed 
a disaster response team to address food insecurity and other humanitarian needs in the region. I also urged the U.S. government to prioritize Central America in future efforts to distribute excess vaccines and provide resources to help countries buy COVID-19 vaccine directly. As the U.S. government takes a longer term and more holistic approach to addressing migration, I believe that promoting democratic governance and human rights must be central. We need to tackle corruption. We saw progress in Guatemala and Honduras when the international community provided backing and protection to courageous domestic prosecutors. The anti-corruption mission in Guatemala helped reduce hem homicides by 5% annually during the 10-year period in which it operated. It showed that reducing corruption directly advances all our other policy goals. Unfortunately, there are economic and political elites in these countries who will fight tooth and nail to protect the status quo. In Honduras, after the international mission helped convict prominent officials like the former First Lady, President Hernandez and the Honduran Congress fought back by ending its mandate and pushing through a new criminal code to reduce corruption sentences. In Guatemala, corrupt officials were emboldened after they ended the mandate of CSER. Now they're trying to hijack the judicial selection process and capture the constitutional court. We cannot respond to these setbacks by throwing our arms in the air. We should redouble our support for those investigating and prosecuting high-level corruption. That is why I included language in the Northern Triangle Enhanced Engagement Act, which was led by former Chairman Engel and Ranking Member McCall, and was passed into law last year to sanction officials who, who obstruct corruption investigations or seek to harass or immediate anti-corruption investigations. We also need to support local civil society organizations. In general, the U.S. assistance to support bottom-up solutions that are driven by local leaders. The Inter-American Foundation provides one excellent model for this kind of work. We must also reinforce our foreign assistance with strategic diplomacy. Ambassador Pop is doing a great job in Guatemala. We urgently need Senate-confirmed ambassadors like him in El Salvador and Honduras, who are deeply committed to combating corruption and protecting human rights. Expanding lawful pathway for Central Americans to work in the United States, particularly through the H-2 visa program, should also be part of our regional strategy. I will close my remarks by addressing an issue that threatens to undermine our efforts to engage constructively with countries in Central America. In recent weeks, Salvadorian government officials have attempted to discredit individual members of the United States Congress or to use disinformation to misrepresent individual members' views. Unfortunately, this campaign to manipulate public perception has been supported by millions of dollars in payment to U.S. lobbyists. Members of Congress are receiving death threats and harassment as a result, including this chairman here. Members of Congress are receiving death threats and, and harassment. As recently, it escalated to the point where El Salvador head of state urged a member of Congress constituents to vote her out of office and decimated conspiracy theories supported by her political opponents. This is foreign election interference. If it continues, we will confront it as a national security threat to the United States. During his short time in office, President Bukele has achieved a historic reduction in violent crimes. crimes. Maybe more important, he has given Salvador, Salvadorians hope, and he deserves credit for that. But diplomacy is not a one-way street. Exposure to criticism is one of the burdens of leadership. Trust me, I have gotten plenty of it in my 15 years in Congress. I have spent my time in Congress advocating for closer U.S. engagement with countries throughout Latin America and in the Caribbean. 
because I care deeply about the people in this region, and I believe wholeheartedly in the capacity and the autonomy of the people in this, in this region. I want to promote U.S. interests while lifting up our neighbors throughout the Western Hemisphere. This can only be done if we engage with one another in good faith about the issues where we agree and those where we see things differently. Let's commit to fostering a culture of integrity, decency, and mutual respect. That is what all our constituents deserve. Thank you, and I will now turn to the Ranking Member Green for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Sirius, and thank you to our witnesses. We're here to discuss the crisis of illegal migration from Central America and address its root causes. It's a timely topic. As President Biden caused the massive surge at the border, failed to understand how it happened, named the vice president in charge who has yet to visit the border, and failed to listen to members of his own administration and party who actually seemed to get it. Unfortunately, there's no action other than a highly suspicious $87 million hotel bill, $350 a night per room, and as we saw yesterday, a $530 million no-bid contract, and I quote, potentially worth more than 12 times the group's most recently reported annual budget, according to Axios. But I'd also like to report that there are members at the State Department with whom I've had conversations who do get it. You can't just announce a $4 billion in cash payment, pass amnesty in the House, strike down all barriers, and when the rush to the border happens, expect people to believe it's Trump's fault. The administration is literally hanging a welcome sign at our border, but many Democrats are actually acknowledging quietly to us that that's stupid. And that gives me hope. You see, some of them recognize, like many of us, that there are three stages to migration. And if you would, consult the handout that I've provided at each uh, of your seats. First, this committee meeting is being held to mainly address those push factors that you see on the handout that I've shared. Like improving the safety of people in their home countries and developing prosperity opportunities that make staying in their home country attractive. However, we should also reinstate path migration factors like recruiting the Mexican government to block its southern border, something the previous administration did, as well as reinstating barriers to entry and asylum agreements which disincentivize illegal migration. Since this hearing is primarily focused on push factors, I'd like to share my vision to solve those issues. We have an opportunity to address them as well as other foreign policy crises in one fell swoop. Let me first summarize the problems. Economic opportunity in Latin America was severely disadvantaged by the commodity boom and corresponding rise in currency values caused by China's growth. It became cheaper for Latin Americans to buy Chinese goods. And as they did, they lost their own manufacturing base and the corresponding jobs. That's problem one. China, on the other hand, gained those manufacturing jobs, creating a global dependency on that country that was on full display during the COVID crisis. That dependency is an issue for the United States, PPE, medications, problem two. The loss of opportunity in Latin America, as my handout displays, has created a substantial push for migration out of Latin America and to our southern border, problem three. However, Instead of just throwing more cash at the problem with no accountability, we should redirect existing dollars already appropriated for Latin America to incentivize companies to move manufacturing from China to Latin America, decrease our dependency on China, increase manufacturing and job opportunities for our brothers and sisters to the south, and decrease the push factors and pressure on our southern border. This is a win-win-win. And I'm working on legislation to this effect and hope to collaborate across the aisle with you, Mr. Chairman, on this. In addition, I urge the Biden administration to fully implement the bipartisan United States Northern Triangle Enhanced Engagement Act enacted in the last Congress. This legislation, as uh, Chairman Sears said, sponsored by former Foreign Affairs Chairman Elliot Engel, addresses significant issues in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Among other things, it requires the Secretary of State and heads of relevant agencies to implement a five-year strategy. While there have been some improvements, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I urge the Biden administration to stop rescinding asylum cooperative agreements, 
that were enacted by the last uh, administration. The results of these policy reversals have been predictable. Rather than requiring migrants to remain in Mexico and their home countries for their claims to be processed, we've created a refugee crisis in American facilities. The Biden administration has gone so far as to offer federal employees four months of paid leave to care for migrant children. This is unsustainable. It's a public health emergency and humanitarian crisis. Migrants are risking their lives on the dangerous trek to the United States, and many are being violently and sexually exploited by human traffickers. Mind you, all of this during a global pandemic. We don't have the strategy or the resources to deal with this. President Biden must show he's serious about ending this crisis. Open borders lead to disaster, but it isn't too late to reverse course. The administration must do so immediately if we're to have any hope of stemming the flow of illegal immigration and the danger refugees face due to our open border process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank you, Ranking Member. I now turn to the full, chairman, full the chairman of the full committee, Congressman Meeks, for our opening statement. First, let me start by thanking uh, my good friend and Chairman Albio Ceres uh, for inviting me to join you all here today. And I'm thrilled to participate in such an important hearing held by this subcommittee. Uh, as we look at the ongoing challenges, both in Central America and at our own southern border, I believe that now is the time for an honest and frank conversation about our commitment and approach to addressing the root causes of migration. And while I'm encouraged by some of the initial approaches taken by the Biden administration, it may take years to recover from the damage done in Central America by the previous administration. The Trump administration's reckless policies of suspending assistance and forcing Guatemala, El Salvador, and the Honduras into joining bilateral asylum cooperative agreements has been a major setback for the United States' credibility in the region. Now, the heavy task of recuperating some of that goodwill falls on the Biden administration. And is it up to us? It is up to us in Congress to play a proactive and supportive role. The countries, the countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and the Honduras have long suffered from violence, corruption, and fractured economic growth. Severe drought experienced in what is known as the dry corridor has devastated communities, taken away jobs, and left people without food. The very real and present danger of climate change has brought on devastating hurricanes and natural disasters that are increasing in frequency and intensity. For years, illegally armed gangs and drug traffickers have had a vice grip on the region, terrorizing women and children, as well as extorting countless families and businesses. And finally, we know that these three countries are facing one of the highest levels of corruption in our region. Given these underlying problems, it should be no surprise that so many Central Americans decide to take the incredibly dangerous journey in the hopes of a better life. The key challenges and drivers of migration in Central America cannot be addressed without serious and constant dialogue between the United States and the governments of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. And while we are, and we will continue to be, critical of some of those governments, we must try and find areas of common ground that we can work as partners together and explore our pathways for action. Rather than cutting assistance, we must explore ways to work around obstructive governments and prioritize funding civil society partners doing crucial work on the ground. Now more than ever, strong implementing partners are needed to help push the region to address countless crucial issues like the debilitating impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, skyrocketing uh, uh, femicide rates, and to reignite anti-corruption and transparency initiatives. At the same time, we also need to provide a space to listen to the most vulnerable in the region and help empower the voiceless. As members of Congress, we must not be afraid to speak out against the numerous injustices that are taking place. In Honduras, we must continue to call for justice for the uh, Berta Ciceris and Keila Martinez and the uh, Jera Funo need, Funa leaders who are missing in Guatemala, who are still missing. 
In Guatemala, we must support indigenous leaders defending their land and ensure that country has a transparent judicial system. In El Salvador, we cannot stay quiet as women who seek abortion remain criminalized and basic press freedoms are under attack. So in closing, again, I'd like to thank you, Chairman Ceres and Ranking Member Green for letting me to participate and join you today. And I look forward to hearing the testimonies from Special Envoy Zuniga and Deputy Assistant Administrator Nati Natiello. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I now turn to Ranking Member McCall for his opening statement. Okay. We will now go before we go to witnesses. I like to take this opportunity. Uh, I to ask unanimous consent that represent Abigail Spanberger, Scott Perry, Sarah Jacobs, and Ronnie Jackson participate at today's hearing after all subcommittee members have, have had the opportunity to participate and question any witnesses. No objection? Thank you. We will now go to our witnesses. First, thank you very much for being here today. I will now introduce Mr. Ricardo Zuniga. He's, pres he's President Biden's special envoy for the Northern Triangle at the U.S. Department of State and a career member of the Senior Foreign Service. Mr. Suniga was previously the interim director of the Brazil Institute and a senior diplomatic fellow at the World War Wilson Center. His government assignments have included serving as U.S. Consul General in Brazil, special assistant to the President and Senior Director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council and Political Council at the U.S. Embassy in Brazil. Mr. Zuniga, thank you for being with us today, and we welcome you to our hearing. We will then hear from Peter Natiello. He is the Deputy Assistant Administrator in the U.S. Agency for International Development's Latin America and Caribbean Bureau. Mr. Natiello has served as a U.S. aid mission director in Afghanistan, El Salvador, Colombia, and Bolivia. He began his career with U.S. aid in Bolivia, and he has also managed U.S. aid democracy and governance programs in Ecuador. Before joining the Foreign Service, Mr. Natiello served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador and as a research analysis with the Inter-American Development Bank. Mr. Natiello, thank you for joining us. I ask each witness to please limit your testimony to five minutes, and without objection, your prepared statement will be made part of the record. Mr. Suniga, you are recognized for your t testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking member and members of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm, I'm honored to have this opportunity to speak with you and honored to serve as the State Department Special this Envoy. This meeting is being recorded. Special Envoy uh, to the Northern Triangle. Before I begin on the substance of my remarks, I did want to first address the matter you raised regarding interference in the U.S. political process uh, experienced by members uh, of the House. And uh, I wanted to communicate that that is unacceptable under any circumstances that concerns raised by members on a bipartisan basis uh, regarding governance issues uh, have also been shared and transmitted uh, with the government of El Salvador. Uh, like you, we very much seek a constructive relationship uh, with the government of El Salvador. We believe it's important and we have a stake in the success of El Salvador. Uh, on these issues, just like uh, in any other case where uh, a foreign government or foreign actors intervene in the U.S. political process, that's something we must firmly reject uh, at the earliest opportunity, and we have done so. Thank you. In my role as Special uh, Envoy, uh, my job is to advise the Secretary of State and oversee the Department's plan for a comprehensive approach to migration in North and Central America. To do that, 
I engage with governments in the region, including Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras on a range of issues. My work is part of a much broader national effort defined by President Biden in his February 2nd executive order creating a comprehensive regional framework. I, excuse me, I have to interrupt you. We have a technical issue. It must be your comments that you started with. <laughs> We've been sabotaged. You'll let me know as soon as it's corrected. Chairman, I'd recommend resetting the clock, please. Yes. Thank you. See, it's not that bad. Sh shall I? <laughs> no way. Okay. No, we'll reset your clock for the five minutes. Thanks for waiting. This meeting is being recorded. We start? Not yet. Well, I, now I feel at home. All right, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. Thank you uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm honored to have this opportunity to speak with you and honored to serve as the State Department's Special Envoy to the Northern Triangle. And my role as Special Envoy, uh, my job is to advise the Secretary of State and oversee the Department's plan for a comprehensive approach to migration in North and Central America. To do that, I engage with governments in the region, Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala in particular, on a range of issues. And my work is also part of a much broader national effort defined by President Biden in his February 2nd executive order, creating a comprehensive regional framework on migration. This approach includes a collaborative strategy for managing migration through North and Central America, for addressing the root causes of forced displacement and irregular migration over the long term. The Vice President leads this national effort and the State Department supports and advances the objectives set by the Vice President and defined for U.S. agencies. Since assuming this role on March 16th, I've traveled with senior State Department and National Security Council officials to Mexico, Guatemala, and El Salvador, where we spoke with a wide variety of stakeholders. And here I want to emphasize our intent to engage the whole of society, just as all of U.S. society has a stake in the outcomes in Central America, so too does the whole of society in Central America. So on every visit, I met with members of civil society, the private sector, government, of course, and other interested members, uh, including uh, media. The message I'm sharing is that the United States is committed to working with governments uh, and all those who, are, who share a common vision uh, of a prosperous, secure, and democratic Central America. We do so while enforcing U.S. immigration laws and promoting safe, orderly, and humane migration and improving access and protection for those who need it. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I think it's very clear uh, to the United States uh, and to the partners of the United States that uh, the current episode of migration from Central America is part of a recurring pattern of mass migration driven by the push factors that have been defined uh, here earlier today. Insecurity, lack of opportunity, and most of all, despair that lives are going to improve in Central America. Our job, our very difficult job as a government, working in consultation with Congress, working with the stakeholders I described earlier, is to find a way forward, first of all, to enforce our laws, enforce our borders, but also to demonstrate that there are other legal pathways that can be used by those seeking legal migration to the United States, and most of all, generating hope in Central America that they might have a better day and a reason to stay. Right now, the logic, uh, as you described it, uh, is on the side of the push factors. 
aided by coyotes who are misrepresenting uh, the conditions on the U.S. border and suggesting that it is an easy path to arrive in the United States. It's important to underscore here that people seeking safety, people seeking prosperity, people seeking justice have a right to have all of those things in their countries. And we appreciate the recognition uh, uh, when that is provided by leaders in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala about that right. Our work is to help generate the enabling conditions that make that possible. That is difficult work, as you say, difficult work that will take many years to accomplish, but we have to begin somewhere uh, and we have to build on what's already been accomplished. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Natal. Chairman Sirius, Ranking Member Green, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Addressing the root causes of irregular migration from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras is a top priority for USAID. And we're grateful for this committee's ongoing bipartisan support for our work. At the direction of President Biden, USAID is aggressively ramping up programs to address the economic, security, and governance challenges that drive irregular migration from Central America. There's no doubt that the conditions on the ground are difficult. COVID-19 um, plus the damage wrought by hurricanes Eta and Iota have only further complicated the situation. To help mitigate the impact of recurrent drought, severe food insecurity, and COVID-19, USAID recently deployed a disaster assistance response team to Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Thank you for mentioning that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, providing, uh, providing urgent, uh, Life-saving humanitarian aid is a key part of USAID's mission, and we're also extremely focused on addressing the root causes of irregular migration. USAID uses data to identify migration hotspots so that we can scale up and focus our programs on would-be migrants from vulnerable places and help return migrants reintegrate into their communities. Our programming strengthens economic opportunity, security, and governance, and builds resilience to climate change in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. We know that opening doors to employment and education for citizens in their home countries will lead to safer, more prosperous societies, which is why USAID is broadening economic opportunities, especially for young people who are most at risk of migrating. As just one example, in Guatemala, USAID recently inaugurated a new agricultural center in Huehuetenango, an area of high out migration. This center will help more than 20,000 small farmers improve their productivity connect them to markets and increase their incomes. While fostering improved economic opportunities is key, these efforts will not be successful if security challenges are not addressed. El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, as, as, as has been noted, are among the most violent countries in the world, and their citizens are the target of crime and violence from criminal groups and gangs. USAID is reaching those most at risk of being victimized or committing crime and violence. Per, per President Biden's February 2nd executive order, we're particularly focused on addressing rampant gender-based violence in the region. To address this in El Salvador, USAID provided assistance to establish 52 victims assistance centers operating at justice institutions with staff trained to provide legal and psychosocial services to victims, including victims of gender-based violence. USAID also supported a specialized training program for judges related to gender-based violence crimes. Transparent, accountable governance is also essential. And the citizens of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras deserve nothing less. That's why USAID works with civil society organizations to increase transparency, build respect for human rights, and promote accountability. In Guatemala, we've, we've recently done this through support to the Attorney General's Office to expand services to new municipalities. In fact, last week, the Attorney General's Office with our ambassador uh, inaugurated 68 municipal prosecutor's offices expanding services from 16% of the nation to 100% coverage. These types of interventions are, helped, are, are helping extend access to justice and to stop impunity. In Central America, climate change is also a serious issue, contributing to more severe droughts and hurricanes and reduced water availability. Without predictable harvests that can provide stable sources of income, many rural Central Americans are driven away from their home, their homes so that they can feed their families. We're building resilience in Guatemala and Honduras by promoting innovative practices and technologies that help farmers maintain and increase sustained yields throughout the year. 
For example, in Honduras, in the dry corridor, which was mentioned earlier, USAID investments have provided agriculture and nutrition assistance to 251,000 people in recent years. And these beneficiaries have reported that their intention to migrate was 78 percent lower than the country overall. As the former USAID director in El Salvador, I've seen firsthand the powerful human impact of our programming. At the same time, USAID approaches this challenge with humility. Uh, we know that more needs to be done to ensure people have opportunities to build a better future in their home countries. As USAID scales up efforts to address the root causes of migration, we also recognize that assistance alone will not be enough. Our success in the region depends on a long-term commitment by governments, the private sector, and civil society to combat corruption and improve governance. To close, we're committed to supporting countries in their efforts at becoming stronger, safer, and more prosperous so citizens can remain at home and create a better future for themselves and their families. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. We will now start with members' questions. I'll start myself. Um, you know, I've been in this committee now for 15 years. And for years, I have advocated that this country should focus more intensely in the Western Hemisphere. Whether I haven't, you know, I, I've noticed that we just don't focus enough on this region where there is a Republican, Democratic. And I am very happy to hear that President Biden now is really focusing on this region. But, you know, like anything else, it has to be sustained. We're not going to change the things that are wrong with this country or so help change the things that are wrong in this country overnight. And one of the concerns that I always have is the corruption, corruption piece that when we're just getting ahead in some of these areas, you know, all of a sudden there's a change. And all the good things that we did for a few years is, is thrown out. So I was just wondering if you can talk a little bit about sustaining the effort of this country in the region to make sure that we just don't do it when there's a crisis at the border, that we need to focus on fixing some of the issues there. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I believe you, uh, you identified exactly the most important issue here, which is sustainability. The United States have a long, has a long-term commitment in Central America, particularly dating from the 1980s forward. Uh, we've uh, assisted through uh, multiple initiatives, beginning with the Caribbean Basin, Basin Initiative uh, and our uh, security support during the 1980s, and extended over decades uh, various levels of support. But as you say, the conditions in Central America have worsened over time, and at this point, uh, the question is, how do we arrest that slide? Our cooperation in Central America is really focused on three areas, security cooperation to improve uh, that very high level of crime that citizens experience, uh, prosperity promotion so that people can have a, uh, a way of life that's dignified and gives them reason to remain rooted, and third, governance. And I would say that as President Biden uh, approaches this issue, he has put governance at the very center and anti-corruption at the center precisely because you cannot have those other two, prosperity uh, or security, if you don't have a government in which citizens can have confidence, a government that delivers the public good uh, and which deals with cases of corruption from the inside and works to improve its performance. Our approach uh, is really learns from the experience of CCG and Maxi. Uh, CCG in Guatemala and Maxi in Honduras, in a proven model. And that proven model is that there are people in Central America, within the public sector, in civil society, and in the private sector, who have the political will and who have the capacity to improve governance, but they face entrenched corruption in many cases. 
and systems that have uh, worked to prevent government from working at the service of the people. Our job is, uh, as an outside actor, is to recognize that change has to come from Central America. In order to be sustained, it must, come, it must be organic and it must come from the systems that exist, but with political cover and other technical support for those who are willing to do the hard work of uncovering and dealing with uh, corruption. That's the only way that we can have sustainability in these other uh, areas. I mentioned uh, CCIG and MAXI. Again, the model works uh, when you have outside support, and not just from the United States. It can be from uh, the OAS. In the case of CCIG, it was with the United Nations. But in the case of El Salvador, uh, we had a very active attorney general, uh, uh, Melendez, who all he required was the support of the U.S. Embassy plus the support of a few other external actors. And what we see is that if you have that level of international support and clear backing for those actors, they have enormous public backing. The political will exists. It exists in the population. And our job is to try to find ways to energize that and have that turn into policy locally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. My time is up. Congressman Green. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And again, thank you both for your uh, testimony today. Uh, congratulations on your, your new positions. I want to uh, really appreciate that and um, for your service to the country. Um, uh, thanks for the call yesterday. Uh, uh, I really appreciated that and enjoyed uh, starting our relationship. I think there's a real opportunity for some bipartisanship here. I mean, I really do. Despite all the other stuff where we disagree, um, I think most, or, or let, me, let me make sure my words are as accurate as I can make them. There are many Democrats and many Republicans who recognize that dependence on China is bad for America, certainly in certain supply chains. Um, I think there are Democrats and Republicans who see that manufacturing jobs have been significantly lost and opportunity in Latin America is down. And I think there are Democrats and Republicans who see that that decreased opportunity is a part of the push factor out of Latin America. That decreased opportunity and with the corruption and crime, all the other things that we've talked about. So there's an opportunity. And I mentioned this going after whether it's, um, you know, the uh, Development Finance Corporation, you know, private dollars or some other source to incentivize, create incentives to have Chinese, you know, companies that are manufacturing in China move from there to Latin America. It'd be great if they could come to the United States, but in many cases their business models just don't support that. So my question to both of you, and I really want to make sure I leave time for both of you to comment on this, what do you think are the real incentives? And what do we have to do to get those manufacturing jobs from China to Latin America? Mr. Ranking Member, thank you very much. That is a crucial point. The real uh, factor in driving improvements in Central America is the creation of opportunities in Central America. Uh, since uh, over the last month, since assuming this role, I've been approached by many U.S. companies and local companies with many ideas uh, about uh, ways to incentivize precisely that uh, transfer of manufacturing from China uh, to Central America uh, in many cases, it involves building out existing capacity. Uh, there is extensive capacity in the textile sector, for example, uh, and I think you identified correctly that we have an opportunity. And, and the fact that China is involved in Central America is because they also see an opportunity. We're, di we're talking about the challenges here today, but it's also important to note that CAFTA DR countries represent our third largest market in, uh, in the Americas. They support 134,000 U.S. jobs. Uh, and that's in dire conditions. If we're able to energize manufacturing, uh, working with the actors that you named, the Development Finance Corporation, uh, the IDB, the World Bank, and other actors, then uh, and identify those roadblocks. And, and they're beginning to come in with those roadblocks. And I would Excellent. really welcome a chance to talk with you about that. Yeah, I look forward to that, too. And from USAID's perspective, I'd really love to hear from you as well, sir. Thank you for that question, Ranking Member. And we absolutely. Uh, are keenly interested and in promote the creation of uh, jobs and the placement of young people in those jobs in, in Central America. We would benefit, our efforts would benefit greatly from greater private investment in the region, certainly. When I was mission director in El Salvador, when I would talk to private sector actors there, both from El Salvador and from other countries, I would ask them, 
What are the things that are, 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 are a break on, on greater private investment here? And they would often name two things. They would name uh, inefficient customs, and they would name uh, high, high energy costs. Uh, and that's why uh, USAID has provided technical assistance to those countries to help improve the efficiency of their custom systems uh, and also to help uh, uh, with the issue of, of a regional uh, integrated energy market for Central America. I do think some of the uh, comments that have been made here this morning about uh, perhaps local monopolies, et cetera, not having an interest in those kinds of regional integrated markets are a block that our diplomatic colleagues have worked on. Uh, they're important to address. Uh, and foreign assistance alone, uh, it, it's, it's tough to break those bottlenecks with foreign assistance alone. It's really important as we work together with the State Department uh, and with our embassies in the region just to address those kinds of uh, governance blockages uh, to the kinds of issues that... Uh, Any that help that we can give in uh, addressing those uh, blockages, as you, to use your, your term, I'm all in. Yeah. Real quick, for the written uh, testimony coming back, because uh, I only have 12 seconds, would love also to hear about your thoughts on China and the commodity boom and its impact on the environment and how much that's a push factor. Uh, and, and I'll have to get that in written testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Green. We now recognize Chairman Gregory Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me get a th again thank you and, and Ranking Member Green. Uh, and I couldn't agree with you more, Mr. Chairman, that uh, part of the problem has been we're not focused enough on the Western Hemisphere. I've been in Congress now for 22 years and on the Western Hemisphere subcommittee uh, for 22 years before I became chairman of this committee. And I'm saying that this committee will be focused in utilizing our oversight responsibility on what we're doing and trying to make in, in uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere and making sure that we have some consistency as to what's taking place. Uh, that is tremendously important. There's a lot that's going on. And when we're talking about the underlying conditions that's taking place in the Northern Triangle, it's time for us to take a real focus on it and come and to make sure that uh, we're getting the best bang for our buck. For example, let me ask this question. You know, I just would look one of the issues that I often, uh, you know, that concerns me. In 2019, the Honduras had the highest femicide rate of any Latin American country. And it was followed by El Salvador and Guatemala was rated seventh in femicides in the region. So, you know, now, then we had COVID-19 and many women and girls were isolated in unsafe environments. And although data on gender-based violence and femicide during the pandemic is hard to collect, we know uh, that there, it's, it continues. So my question is uh, to our witnesses, how does gender-based violence affect women and girls' likelihood of migrating and uh, trying to get their children out? And how will the United States address gender-based violence in a strategy to tackle drivers of migration from the Northern Triangle? Mr. Chairman, thank you for that question, which really is central to the social difficulties and challenges faced across Central America. Gender-based violence is a major push factor, but it's not just that. It's also a major factor in the social dislocation that feeds, for example, the growth of gangs in El Salvador. Uh, and uh, in many cases, we have focused rightly on transnational organized crime uh, and on crime associated with uh, drug trafficking, but the fact is crime is experienced different ways in El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala. Extortion is one way, but violence in the home and violence uh, against women is one of the leading causes of social instability. So the strategy that we're driving uh, is going to put gender-based violence at the center of our work because of its importance across uh, all aspects of society in Central America, including uh, for that matter, in the economy. Women make up a very large proportion of the informal economy. Uh, uh, violence and insecurity experienced by women is a drag on uh, every aspect uh, of social life. Part of this is going to uh, involve raising up the issue uh, of gender-based violence as a, as a core problem, uh, but a lot of it is going to involve work that's been ongoing, working with civil society, working with law enforcement, and working with uh, judiciaries to uh, ensure that women have access to security and access to the judicial system. 
Unfortunately, impunity around domestic violence has also been a key factor in why it has continued. I'm going to uh, allow see if the other witness has uh, other things that he would like to add. Mr. Natiello. Nothing to add. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, and I'm just going to add to the special envoy's response that USAID uses foreign assistance uh, resources to su support uh, responses to gender-based violence. Just two quick examples. In Guatemala, we recently inaugurated with the government two new centers that co-locate 10 or more government services, government institutions, to provide 24-hour services to women and child victims of violence. We're now working with the Guatemalan justice sector to expand this model to other regions of the country. Uh, and I'll just say that uh, in El Salvador, uh, we've supported the establishment of 52 victims assistance centers with the Attorney General's office. These uh, operate with trained staff to provide legal and psychosocial services to victims, including victims of gender-based uh, violence. I visited one of those centers when I was the mission director there in 2018. Uh, and it was good to see uh, those, those women getting the services that they need because we all recognize that gender-based violence is an important driver of irregular migration. Frank, let me just ask another quick question, a uh, little time I have. What impact does climate change have on migration? And do you believe that the United States should receive climate refugees? Yes or no? Climate has an immense uh, impact on migration from Central America. Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe you're familiar with the dry corridor and the expansion of the dry corridor. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, so there has to be an intense focus and has been already. We have dedicated uh, significant resources to helping with um, improve water systems and irrigation systems, and that's also going to be an area of focus. Uh, the, the reality is that we have to help in, in many different ways uh, the agricultural industry adapt to the new realities uh, that we're seeing. Central America is one of the most impacted areas in the world as a result of climate change, affecting everything from the coffee harvest the main export crop of Honduras, for example, uh, to the ability of subsistence farmers to endure one year after another. Uh, and the, finally, I would note that the uh, historic hurricanes, two in a row, one right after the other in November of last year, are further evidence of the vulnerability of the region and why we're spending time there. On the issue of uh, climate refugees, that's beyond my scope as a, a special envoy. and. Uh, but I'm happy to take that question back uh, to the Department of State. Thank you. I'm out of time. I yield back. We're not going to recognize Congressman Fluger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Green. To the witnesses, congratulations, as my colleagues have, uh, have mentioned, for your service, and thank you for uh, stepping forward. Uh, Mr. Zuniga, for you, um, have you been to, uh, to our southern border uh, in the last couple of months to visit any of the... Uh, uh, the facilities, whether they're processing sites, emergency intake facilities? Uh, Representative Fluger, thank you very much for that question. I, I have not been to the southern border to examine the facilities. Uh, my very first posting was actually in Matamoros, Mexico. I'm familiar with the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, but in this role, uh, I've been focused uh, on cooperating with uh, governments in the region uh, and uh, assisting my colleagues who are very focused on the border itself. Uh, which is a, a very large contingent of both DHS, uh, Health and Human Services, and other colleagues. So we, we have a, an HHS facility in my district that was just opened about uh, four weeks ago. And one of the things that, uh, that HHS officials are saying in Midland, Texas, and I, I suspect this is also the same in others, is that the asylum cooperative agreements that were in place um, and, you know, other policies, MPP, that have been rescinded have directly led to an opening a thought, a perception of opening the border. Um, and, and right now you can look at the numbers, I think uh, they speak for themselves, whether it's uh, 34,000 uh, in March of 2020, 172,000 in March of 2021. Um, you know, there, there is an enormous amount of pressure on our southern border. So when will we get, uh, I know there's discussions on, on these cooperative agreements, when will they actually be put back in place uh, from, from the State Department's uh, or the administration's perspective? So uh, President Biden, upon taking office as a part of his executive order, suspended uh, the implementation of the uh, ACAs. Certainly, uh, 
we recognize that there is immense pressure on the southwest border, as there has been in past years. In 2019, there was another massive uh, wave of migration, even though it was very clear that the messaging was that uh, people would not be able to get across the, the border. Uh, our assessment is the push factors at this point, and especially now because of the hurricanes and the effects of the pandemic, uh, are, are driving uh, migration along with messaging, uh, much of it spread by coyotes and, and others who are making money. Do, uh, do you think that, uh, that, that the reason that the cartels, the coyotes, the drug trafficking organizations uh, are incentivized because the HHS officials in, in Midland have told me specifically that, that the, this is the largest amount and percentage of children who are being trafficked in, in the history of, of these issues. So I'm very concerned, and I appreciate your testimony, saying that Vice President uh, Harris is going to take a strong stance to work with agreements in these countries. But to date, I haven't seen any messaging and, and is reflected in the lack of agreements, the reversal of these agreements um, that is causing this surge right now. So um, I, I'd like to understand what, what Vice President Harris is going to do, what y'all are recommending to her um, on communication, coordination, and these, these different agreements with these countries that will stop that surge and actually lead to a more humane um, way of, of dealing with you know, you know, some of these folks who are in bad condition. So I think, uh, uh, Representative Fluger, I think it's very important uh, to, for us to communicate that we are going to enforce our borders, uh, that the law will be enforced. With respect to the ACAs, looking at, back at where they were uh, implemented, it was really only implemented in Guatemala, and the total number of people removed under the ACA was 1,000 people. Uh, given the numbers of people that came in 2019, uh, during that wave and in earlier years and in the current one, that uh, ultimately did not represent much of a disincentive. The other, there, is, there are many ways to communicate and create a psychology that uh, uh, suggests that people have a better reason to stay than to try to make that dangerous journey. Uh, and uh, among other things, uh, we have to work with governments on the communication side of this, and we do that. In uh, case, just for one example, in the case of uh, Guatemala, we communicate in five different indigenous languages uh, using local providers who know the community and using information gleaned from the people who had that experience to highlight the areas that the story is not just don't come, but why shouldn't you come? And I, I appreciate that. I'm going to reclaim the last 15 seconds. And, oh. and, and look, I, I think the comments have been made before. We, we need to f address the root causes, but there are also systemic symptoms that we can communicate better on that that tell cartels and those organizations that are trafficking people that it's not okay to exploit children, especially right now. Title 42 should remain in place. It should be applied uh, across the board, um, especially with the threat of COVID. 10 to 11% in, in Midland, Texas, in our facility, uh, are positive with COVID. And this is just one of the issues that's going on. I would encourage everyone to think about how we communicate. It is imperative that Vice President Harris communicate that our border is closed we will address the situation and the root causes in the best way we can, uh, but right now that message is not being delivered. It needs to be delivered to everyone. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the uh, extra time. We now recognize Congressman Castro, and then we will go to our ranking member, uh, McCall. Uh, thank you. Earlier this week, there were reports that the Biden administration had made an agreement with the governments of Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras to temporarily increase security at their borders in order to stop migrants from reaching the United States border. We've been informed by the State Department that those reports were not accurate and there were no agreements reached with these countries. Rather than agreements, we've been told that there are continued conversations about reducing the flow of migration, including by strengthening border security. As you may understand, these early reports caused many human rights organizations to express concerns about potential escalating violence against migrants in the hands of police and troops. Uh, so I just want to confirm, were there any agreements reached in relation to increasing border security in these countries? Representative Castro, uh, no. There were no agreements concluded with governments regarding uh, border security. Uh, we do agree that it is very important to continue to work together and collaborate to manage migration uh, in a way that enhances the security of every country and allows 
governments to enforce their borders as, as just as the United States does. Uh, in the case of unaccompanied children in particular, this very vulnerable, vulnerable group, one area that we want to continue to work on is uh, with, uh, to enhance the ability of social welfare agencies in each country to identify children that are traveling uh, with caravans and other groups and ensure that they're not able to continue on that dangerous journey unattended by any supervision at all. And there we've had some progress, including in Honduras, uh, including in the most recent uh, caravan. That seems to be an area where uh, we have some additional cooperation. Thank you. All right, uh, I have a question for Mr. Nikillo. Uh, the role and presence of the United Nations in Mexico and Central America has increased significantly in the last several years. Today, organizations like the UN Refugee Agency have an active and daily role in the processing of refugees reaching the U.S.-Mexico border. Can you describe the role of the UN in supporting refugees in the U.S.-Mexico border, at the U.S.-Mexico border? Thanks for that question, uh, Representative. Uh, our colleagues at the State Department, the PRM uh, colleagues, manage the, uh, 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 the refugee challenges, so they're best placed to, uh, uh, to, to, to respond to that. I'll simply say that uh, USAID uh, has important partnerships with uh, UN agencies. Yeah, I was going to ask, how can, can USAID work with the UN um, on this mission? Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. And, um, so, so through our humanitarian uh, assistance programs, and again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we've recently stood up a disaster assistance uh, re response team, a DART. Um, we, we, we had stood one up in November after the hurricanes, took it down, we just stood it up again, given the serious uh, acute food insecurity issues. We work very closely with the UN on uh, humanitarian assistance with the World Food Program, uh, with other UN organizations as well. We have close relationships with the International Organization for Migration. Uh, and with uh, IOM, we're supporting returnees to have a dignified and a humane return back to their countries when they're sent back. With IOM, it's part of the UN system, we support uh, seven returnee centers in the three countries, in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, we also work uh, uh, closely with uh, the uh, 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 UNDP on a program called Info Segura, and it's a really important uh, 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 tool to help the three governments collect data on crime and violence, and the governments and civil societies in those countries are using that data from UNDP to inform the making of public policy and to help mayors come up with better responses for- well, Thank uh, you, Mr. Nantiello. Let me reclaim my time just because I want to make some closing remarks here. Thanks. Um, First of all, Mr. Zuniga, I want to wish you the best of, uh, best of luck on all your very important work. I do think that the Biden administration has a chance to reimagine how we approach this challenge. I think that whatever our politics are, I hope that we can agree that most people don't want to track 1,000 miles leaving their home country, uh, oftentimes with kids in tow, if they don't have to. Uh, I don't think that people consider that a summer camp activity. And so uh, as you think about how you do development, I think we have to be mindful of a few things. I mean, there are current conditions like the natural disasters, the abject poverty, corrupt, leader, corrupt leaders, violent drug gangs uh, that force people to leave their homes. There are also historical facts, including uh, destabilizing U.S. interventions, significant interventions in Latin America over the years, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, uh, that have destabilized the situation there. Uh, and we also have to make sure that in terms of our development work, Often what I've seen is that the part of the way that we measure success is whether American companies get rich doing business down there. That is not the measure of success. I mean, look, we're all for American enterprise. We want our businesses to do well. But if we're talking about lifting a group of people and nations out of poverty, the measure, the primary measure can't be whether, you know, a, a Fortune 500 company or, a, you know, a, it makes a lot of money in Latin America. Uh, so we have to be mindful of what we do with our investments and how we give the people of those nations a stake, including, I think, an ownership stake uh, in this, these enterprises uh, so that they can also uh, take ownership uh, and be lifted out of poverty and, and, and restore the rule of law in many of these places. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Ranking Member McCall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and ranking member for holding this very important uh, and timely hearing. Um, 
I've dealt with this issue probably my entire professional career, both as a federal prosecutor in the Western District of Texas, um, as chairman of the Homeland Security Committee uh, for six years, and now as a ranking member of the full committee um, on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, you'll see in these pictures uh, the recent trip I just returned from the Rio Grande Valley sector. I think, as both of you know, is probably the most active busiest sector um, down on the border right now. Um, it was, um, in my judgment, the worst I've ever seen it. A true humanitarian crisis, uh, a trail of tears coming out of the Rio Grande River to the temporary detention facility, and then to the Donna detention facility, uh, where these children were 100% over capacity in the pod space. 10% have COVID, um, this, that five-year-old crying, not knowing where she was, not knowing her parents aren't there, her family's not there, she's five years old. Um, this should touch all Americans, not just Republicans or Democrats, but it, it's a sad, sad story, and we need to do something about this. Uh, when I talked to the Border Patrol uh, sector chief, he told me this was not a seasonal phenomenon that this was a direct cause and effect by the rescission of certain policies from the previous administration, specifically the Remain in Mexico policy and the agreements that were, were um, hammered out between Central America, the Asylum Cooperation Agreements. On the first day of office, President Biden rescinded these agreements. And within two months, we have the worst crisis we've ever seen down there. And the Border Patrol, you listen to them, not the politicians, they will tell you it's a direct cause and effect of the president's actions. So, but I think we can still solve this problem and we have to, we can't allow this to go on. The traffickers quite simply are controlling our borders now, out resourcing our border patrol agents, uh, better technology, making $15 million a day, almost half a billion dollars a month off these children that they exploit the 40-day trek from Central America, they exploit them and extort, as you know, the families at five to $8,000 a child. Uh, they have to mortgage their homes, their ranches. We also need to address the root cause. I can talk all about border security all day long, but until we address the root cause, it's gonna continue to happen. We passed bipartisan, uh, the chairman uh, and the former chairman, Elliot Engel and I, the Northern Triangle Enhanced Engagement Act signed into law. It requires uh, that basically the administration to submit a five-year strategy to address the drivers of illegal immigration. And I think that is very prescient looking back on it. And we look forward to the report that is due, I think, within the first six months of this administration. I want to close with this. And I have been talking to our ambassadors, uh, Mr. Zaguna, as I know you've been working very closely. I will be meeting with several of them uh, later today uh, about solutions. Uh, one solution I want to throw out to you, if the president's not willing to, to take the, these asylum policies and bring them back in place, we need to look at, I think, a very creative approach. This, this committee uh, authorized into law the Development Finance Corporation. It was designed essentially to eliminate the political risk in developing nations to counter the, the influence of the Chinese Communist Party. I can think of no region in the world where this corporation, the DFC, uh, uh, it could fit better. Given China's activities in, in Central America, I've talked to a lot of investors about whether they think this is an opportunity. And I think the Development Finance Corporation, as you know, gets a return on its investment. Um, I would urge you, and I would look forward to working with you, the two of you, on this very creative approach that I think from a foreign policy standpoint, I would consider this to be a foreign policy blunder, but I think of foreign policy success for all Americans in this administration would be to work with the DFC uh, and private investors. When I talked to the ambassador from Guatemala, he told me that that would help more than anything. Throwing billions of dollars down a rabbit hole in corrupt governance isn't always the answer. But this, I think, is, creates a very good opportunity uh, that we should all be taking advantage of. 
that can really get to the root cause of the problem. With that, I, I, I yield to the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. And I, I have to say, uh, in fact, we have been working very actively with the DFC precisely because we believe that uh, assistance has to be targeted. Uh, it's limited in how we can use it. Often you can't use it with governments for precisely the oversight reasons that you mentioned. Uh, and it really is about creating opportunity. And so we have to work with people who know how to create opportunity. And that's the private sector, that's uh, uh, technical specialists in the DFC and others who know how to build small and medium enterprises, which is the major employer really in Central America beyond manufacturing and large scale enterprises. Uh, there's a lot of talent, in, not just the DFC, but in the partners that they work with. Uh, for example, in the Central American Economic Integration Bank, where they already have $100 million to assist uh, small companies uh, affected by COVID and the pandemic. And there's enormous opportunity there. With, with regard to the strategy, uh, we are, in fact, uh, working on that strategy. We'd like it to be collaborative. Uh, and rather than presenting a, a finished product, what we want to do is bring a product that, and, and we're going to continue to work with, uh, with you and your teams to ensure that we have a, as much of a consensus vision as we can possibly get regarding uh, our, our investment, the investment of tax dollars, but also the investment of, pol of our political uh, profile and our time and the time of members of Congress to uh, address these root causes. And beginning with rule of law, uh, which and creating a level playing field for those who want to invest in Latin America, in Central America. Uh, Ambassador Quinones of Guatemala is an excellent partner. Uh, we completely agree and we've worked very closely with him uh, and look forward to working with you and your team. Mr. Chair, if I could say in closing, I'm not, I'm really not in interested in scoring political points on, in the backs of these children. What I am interested in doing is solving a crisis and it is a crisis. Um, so I, I would offer um, my assistance to work with this administration to resolve this issue uh, because it is, um, it's an American issue that we need to fix for these children precisely. And this is, uh, Mr. Chairman, why this committee, I think, had the foresight to, to authorize the Development Finance Corporation into law in the first place. I was one of the, the main authors of that bill, and I know this is precisely what it was designed to do. And so thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. We now recognize Congressman Andy Levin for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this incredibly important hearing. Hurricanes Eta and Iota devastated Guatemala and Honduras last year. People lost their homes and in some cases their crops, schools and access to roads. These storms were part of the most active Atlantic hurricane season on record. And climate change experts say it's just a preview of what's to come for Central America. Storm winds and rains are getting heavier and storms are getting slower, sitting on top of communities for days at a time. Experts say that as these impacts of climate change intensify, we should expect to see even more migration northward. So let me ask both of you to comment briefly. Given that the region has struggled with repeated environmental shocks in recent years, does the administration intend to put a greater emphasis on climate adaptation efforts as part of its plans to tackle the root causes of migration? Thank you very much, Representative Levin. Yes, uh, that is absolutely the intent uh, of the administration. Uh, as you say, the extraordinary vulnerability of populations in Central America to the uh, effects of climate change which are felt today and uh, in recent years and, and not at some future date, we understand that that's a major driver of insecurity uh, and uh, lack of opportunity in Central America. That seems like a very uh, clear area that, in which we need to uh, put our focus. That happens to be one of the areas where the Vice President is very focused as well. Uh, and we are looking to work with partners to, to drive that agenda. Mr. Nautiello, do you want to comment briefly? Yes, thank you very much for that question. And we see climate change certainly as a, as a critical issue for the region. Uh, USAID has and will continue, and we expect to deepen our efforts under uh, the current administration to, uh, to support communities, particularly in the dry corridor, 
to support communities uh, mm -hmm. to better manage their water, so better watershed management. We currently do, uh, we work with uh, thousands of farm families on drip irrigation. We've had great success with that. As I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, we've reached about 250,000 people in Honduras in the dry corridor there uh, with those efforts. Those are increasing incomes, and those people say uh, that they are uh, less inclined to migrate than uh, the national average. Uh, we, we also help farmers diversify their crops to manage their risks against climate change, and particularly by uh, introducing agroforestry and tree crops, because uh, those are important for climate uh, as well. And the last thing I'll say is that our Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance at USAID is very focused on these issues. Uh, they just stood up a disaster assistance response team and are providing support now, given the, the acute food insecurity in the region that we're seeing. Um, and that's, that will continue to be an important intervention for USAID. We'll continue to support governments in terms of strengthening their capabilities to manage, uh, to, to, to better manage uh, disasters and to get out ahead of them so that there's a lower impact on uh, human lives. Over. Thank you. All right. Let me, let me um, move to my next point. And since you already spoke to this, I'm just going to ask you to get back to me on it. Um, regardless of how well we do with mitigation, the impacts of climate change are so massive at this point that we're not going to uh, prevent climate refugees from Central America from migrating northward altogether and the short term, certainly. So I'm going to ask you to get back to me. You said that, um, you know, the, the whole question of asylum for climate refugees is something that you're not sure about or it's not in your wheelhouse. I'm going to ask you to get back to me about uh, the administration's policy, because we this is something we simply have to deal with. Finally, let me ask you, Mr. Sunika, um, about uh, the hit our history in Central America, our history of intervention, which is both very long and goes to uh, very recent times, including overthrowing democratic governments. What can you tell us about the level of trust or, on the other hand, the level of skepticism that exists in the region about the, our relationship? And how does that impact your diplomatic efforts? And given the level of skepticism, what do you think can be done to rebuild trust uh, it, between the United States and the countries of the Northern Triangle? Thank you, uh, Representative Thank Levin. You. I think the important point here is uh, twofold. One, that uh, certainly we have a complex history in Central America. We also have very deep connections between our societies. Just in the case of El Salvador, with three million Salvadorans living in the United States, uh, the reality is that they view, Central Americans view themselves as deeply connected to the United States. Uh, and I would say that the recent episodes demonstrate that when things go wrong in Central America, they impact the United States. That's why it's so important for us to respond as a nation on that point. The second point I would say is, how do we uh, build trust? First, by presence, by being there, by demonstrating that we are on the side of those who are enduring difficult, difficult conditions, uh, and in particular in the area of governance. They should have hope, and that is something that the United States can do uh, in a very clear way. Thank you. We're now All right, my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. We now recognize Congresswoman Salazar. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Ricardo Suñiga, welcome, and uh, may the Lord help you with your new job. Um, you know, I'm just, I represent District Number 27, which is the home of thousands of people from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Miami the capital of the Americas. Not only I lived in Central America, I was a war correspondent for Univision Network while the Civil War was going on. So I not only love the area, know it very well, but re now represent the people. Uh, we have been talking about ch uh, child sex trafficking, which is, I'm sure you know, one of the fastest growing international crimes in the world. And unfortunately, the southern border is the port of entry. This year, the Biden administration has uh, apprehended 52,000 families, but only 140, 52,000 under 140 were DNA tested. So that means that we do not know if the adult that is accompanying that child is the father or the trafficker. And now 
uh, it has stopped running DNA samples, the administration. So, in other words, if you think about it, the American authorities are facilitating the traffickers to keep their praise. Don't you think this is embarrassing? This is a problem. Thank you, Representative Salazar. I, I agree that uh, it is a priority to identify uh, and for uh, the U.S. authorities to, uh, to be able to make sure that the welfare of the children is at the top of the agenda. But it's not happening. It's not happening, and there's no money to it. Now let's go to the money that's what we're here for. Four billion dollars in direct cash payments to Central America. I agree with you that we should have a Marshall Plan in place for the area. But when you see that the Hondurians, one out of ten dollars in Honduras goes to the hands of corruption or to corrupt politicians or to the drug cartels. And in Guatemala, 65 percent of the Guatemalans do not trust the government. One out of four has paid a bribe. Who are we giving this money to? To the NGOs? So primarily to, first of all, uh, we completely agree that oversight of U.S. taxpayer dollars has to be the priority. Great. So, so the way that we do that is by working with trusted partners who have reliably worked. And who are those? And so uh, it depends on the, uh, on the circumstance, but usually it's uh, implementers that the United States has a long experience with that are either in the United States or in the region. So, uh, but who are they? NGOs, NGOs private NGOs, sector? Uh, because the private sector doesn't have, this bill doesn't include any, any monies directly to the private sector. And as uh, my Congress, my colleague, Congressman um, Mark Green said that we need to be giving incentives to the private sector to attract those American companies that leave China and come to Central America but you don't have one penny in this $4 billion package that will do that. So the money that we're talking about here is money that's for development assistance. There is funding that goes to finance, uh, to prioritize financing. The Development Finance Corporation has, uses and uh, stimulates private uh, lending, but there is also uh, additional forms of financing. How much is that? Don't uh, you think that a, a piece of the $4 billion should be going to incentivize the American companies to come to Central America and absorb that labor force? At this point, uh, I believe the Development Finance Corporation has over a billion dollars invested in facilitating uh, the economy and stimulating the economy in Central America with a focus on small, medium sized That's a good start. Business. You know, corruption. We've been talking about corruption. Starts when the police force stops doing its job and loses credibility. Here's a fact, 66% of Hondurians don't have any confidence in their police force. And look at Guatemala. Look, that's the Guatemalan map. Those red dots are land invasions by narcos and the Guatemalan forces do not have the capacity to go in there. It's the whole country. Did you know about this? I'm sure you will. So, this $4 billion package does not include security cooperation agreements. What is that? American advisors, ex-military colonels or military personnel going and living in those countries and helping train those, I'm sure you know this, and helping train the police forces in Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, the whole Central America. This $4 billion package doesn't have any of that. So if, you, if the police force cannot go save their own people, do you think the NGOs are really going to invest anything or any money in this? So don't you think it would be a good idea? So did you know about the security cooperation agreements? So Representative Salazar, actually a, a percentage of the $4 billion is going to go through uh, state INL, which is uh, intended to support exactly the kind of uh, police units, particularly vetted units uh, that we can trust, uh, to help us uh, overcome the very significant threat of transnational organized crime. And I, I think you exactly identified the main point here, which is lack of trust in government. And that requires work on behalf of our partners. We can but in simple terms, in which way we, our military, can help and train those police officers or those police forces? U.S. military cooperation in Central America has been a vital supporter of stability, but also governance. And that is going to remain a, a very important fact of our cooperation. Uh, U.S. Southern Command has extensive relationships and uses those to promote exactly the kind of close collaboration and respect for civilian leadership 
that we support in the United States. But you are not giving them extra funds to expand that program coming from the Southern Command in this four billion direct, pay, direct cash payments to the Central American governments. So uh, there is security cooperation over which DOD has control through DOD funding. And then you also have uh, uh, basically collaboration between U.S. Southern Command and the work that's done with development dollars. And just as one example, uh, the U.S. Southern Command also helped build resilience for natural disaster response, and they were very active after the hurricanes. In fact, they were the first forces on the ground uh, in Guatemala and Honduras in delivering and aid, but also in rescuing people. So right, thank, we, we have a very close relationship thank you. with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congressman Vicente Gonzalez, you're on. Thank you, uh, and thank you to the panel, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if folks, ask you. I have a few questions, so if you can keep your answers as concise as possible. Uh, the, the, and I, I agree with a lot of what Representative Salazar just said. Uh, the Biden administration has emphasized the importance of, of the private sector in creating employment opportunities in the formal sector and contributing to economic growth for communities in the Northern Triangle. The concern seems to be in the U.S. is uh, these funds going to corrupt institutions or officials or NGOs that really don't get the job done. We've invested hundreds of millions already, and 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 really, we a lot of us don't see the results. What are we doing differently this time to be able to measure results and be able to pull the plug on something that's not working uh, early on before we go all the way in? Do we have a system in place to where we have expectations? whether it's an NGO or a, the private sector or, um, or whatever government institution we're dealing with. So that does not happen. Thanks for that question, uh, Representative. Just a few quick points on that. Uh, as a general rule at USAID, we don't give our funds to uh, foreign governments. That's particularly the case uh, in the Northern Triangle. Just to put it in perspective of our FY 2020 budget of $311 million, 5.8 million, I believe, went to government. That's about 1.6% of, of the total appropriation uh, in 2020. Uh, again, we work with trusted uh, partners, contractors, NGOs, international organizations like the UN that I mentioned earlier. We work through grants and contracts that are subject to audits. Uh, the, the, the oversight starts with our field teams at missions in the three countries, at our field missions in the three countries. And it certainly extends to the, uh, to, uh, the USAID it's, uh, uh, Inspector General who, who watches those? But what are we? And, or, and, yeah. re, re, what are we doing to to check in on them regularly, every so often, to assure we're moving in the right direction? Uh -huh. Because we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars in Central America, and still, uh, I can tell you, I represent a, a border district, the Rio Grande Valley, that has really been hit hard by uh, the complexities of Central America. So I'd love to see the investments uh, have results, and and hopefully. Uh, calm the migration that we have yeah. uh, coming in. What are we doing besides getting NGOs and USAID? Do we have a plan in place to have measurable results uh, before we spend all these uh, these billions of dollars that we're, we're committed to, uh, to assure that at the end of the day, we have measurable results that uh, have a lasting impact on our southern border? So for, for thank you for that, sir. For all the investments that we make, we do have uh, performance monitoring plans. We have project managers that uh, monitor uh, regularly those investments. Uh, we absolutely uh, take feedback from our monitoring systems and we make adjustments. I'll just give you one quick example. When I got to El Salvador in 2017, we had just uh, cut off a project uh, in a municipality where the mayor was not keen to work with us and he wasn't serious about addressing the challenges that we wanted to address in partnership with him and with his uh, with his uh, municipality. More recently in El Salvador, uh, we took a look at our data. We take a hard look at data on who's migrating and why. And we use that data to shut down one line of effort, which was university partnerships. And we're moving it uh, toward more vocational training for young men, uh, unemployed, victims of violence in urban areas. So we right. absolutely take a very I have a few more questions I'd like to ask. The next concern is Honduras, uh, as we know, the president's, uh, the present president's brother is serving a life term sentence here in the United States. I think he's been looking at, he's been looked at. And now we have a candidate, uh, Yanni Rosenthal, who spent four years in U.S. prison and is now, I believe, is indicted. What are we doing to assure that P 
people like this don't become presidents of these countries. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Gonzalez. I think the, the important here to point out that it's really up to the people of Honduras to elect their leaders. Uh, but of course, the United States selects who we work with. And as we've made very clear, uh, we are prepared to work with those who are as committed as we are to the fight against corruption uh, and transnational organized crime. So we respect the elections, uh, but we also uh, have standards for the people that we work with. Yeah, this is a, obviously a clear concern. And lastly, and I know we're running out of time, is, and, and I, some of y'all may know, I've been advocating being on the border and on border with small municipal communities that cannot, do not have the resources to deal with, you know, the last 173,000 people who came mostly to my section of the border uh, has really overwhelmed us and overwhelmed, you know, all our local capacity. And what I've advocated for is to have the same system that we have in my district in a very humane, clean, first-class American facilities closer to them on the southern Mexican border or the Guatemalan border, because I don't believe this is going to end. I mean, we're talking about climate migration down the road and, other, and maybe other countries down the road. What are we doing in planning long-term ideas to be able to help folks closer to home and have these processing centers and maybe refugee uh, uh, settlements or whatever it is to do to help this mass migration that's coming north further south and to keep them from coming through Mexico, which at this time, uh, me and my neighboring congressman calculated that just in the last 90 days, cartels have probably been enriched uh, about $1.2 billion just from the migration that ha occurred this year at $6,000 a head, with an average of $6,000 a head that they're charging. I figure that if we had the operations that we have in my district in cooperation with either with Mexico or Guatemala or both on that border and had the same system in place, and whether you're looking for a credible threat or ultimately I envision actually having being able to have your asylum hearing in safe zones where we can assure their guarantee their safety. Um, I think we need to start having out of the box ideas or we're gonna continue dealing with this on our Southern border. And when I say doing this in these countries, I mean doing it in a fashion that is first class, that is respectable, that is humane, that is clean and dignified, no different than as if they came to the United States. And if they, uh, if they have a credible threat or if they, uh, they're they granted asylum, they can just get an airplane and fly in and take the cartels out of this equation. And with Thanks. that, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. You want to respond to that? If I, if I could, uh, uh, Congressman, you, you have exactly defined our effort in Mexico and in Northern Central America to build that capacity locally because, among other things, Mexico is no longer just a transit country, it's a destination country. Uh, and we do know that, uh, and in fact, we've committed significant resources over the last few years working with international organizations to build protection capacity uh, into the immigration systems uh, along the way and in close collaboration with governments in Mexico and in Central America to do precisely that. Uh, and it, as you say, the importance has to be treating people with dignity and giving them access to the resources uh, locally so that they don't feel like they have to transit to the U.S. border. Thank you. Thank you. We're Thank now, you. I, 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 well, no, uh, I'd uh, love uh, to be. Lo siento. Sorry. Uh, we now recognize Juan Vargas, who's a member of the committee, and then we'll do Mr. Scott Perry. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, again, the opportunity to speak. Um, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and the ranking member, of course, as well as um, the witnesses who have testified here today. Um, I want to agree with some of the things my colleagues have said on the other side of the aisle. I certainly think that China poses the greatest threat for the United States going forward, and I do think that many of the things they're doing in Central America are very damaging, uh, not only to Central Americans, but certainly to us. And I do hope that there are ways for us to bring manufacturing back to the United States. And if we can't bring it back to the United States, Central America or Mexico or other places, because again, I think that China is our, not only our greatest competitor, but our greatest threat. I agree with that, my colleagues on the other side. Um, I do agree also that many of them that who spoke and have great sensitivity and uh, and love for the children that are coming and want to take care of them. I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. But the notion that we have open borders is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. I live on the border. I can tell you we have 60 miles of border in San Diego, linear border. 
We have 2,200 border patrol agents. In 1993, we had 1,000. If you take a look at some of the apprehensions that we've had, um, certainly they're high, but nowhere near as high as we had in the 18, in 1986, 96. We, we had ones that reached up to 1.6 million. The numbers were much, much larger. It all depends on what happens in Central America or Mexico. We've had, of course, these disasters in Central America. We've had these two giant hurricanes. And something that was brought up uh, just slightly by, by my colleague, uh, Representative Salazar, I too lived in El Salvador for a while. I was a Jesuit at the time studying to be a priest. I was in an orphanage. I can tell you during that civil war, 200,000 Guatemalans were killed, most of whom were murdered because there were indigenous people that were supposedly potentially guerrillas or guerrilla sympathizers. They were murdered by death squads, they were murdered by the military. In El Salvador, 70,000 people were killed during that civil war. Again, many murdered by death squads and also by the military, So, including a, a number of my Jesuit colleagues. So. When you take a look at what has happened in Central America, it's, it's been a disaster. But the notion that this is new, that this has never happened before, is not true. We've had this in our history. I can tell you along California, I've lived most of my life along the border in California and Mexico. We have different times, large numbers of migrants coming. That's just the way it's been. Um, I do want to ask, however, about the issues associated with the two hurricanes, and especially in Honduras. It does sound like climate change, um, the dry areas that they speak of, have really been disastrous for um, Honduras and the rest of the country, there, but especially Honduras. Could someone comment directly on that? Uh, maybe Mr. Zuniga. Uh, thank you, Representative Vargas. And I, I should just add, I was with the rector of the University of Central America, uh, Padre Andreu, last week. Uh, and had an opportunity to uh, speak with him about the work done by uh, the Jesuit community in, in El Salvador and the work that they continue to do uh, to promote civil society and human rights in Central America. With regard to the hurricanes, uh, we're talking about a, a storms that displaced hundreds of thousands of people uh, that, as uh, the chairman noted at the very beginning, affected nine million people in total in Central America over a period of, of several weeks. That, that disaster is not over. Uh, it continues. Uh, there remain, <clears throat> excuse me, tens of thousands of people who are effectively displaced, joining, in the case of Honduras, up to 250,000 people who are already displaced for other, for other causes. This is the community that is highly at risk, and so this is why uh, we dedicate significant resources to attending to their humanitarian needs as an acute matter, as opposed to being a root cause. This is an acute cause. And we need to focus on victims of disaster uh, now, and that is how uh, we've been directed to uh, uh, dedicate our early time and attention. And we're pleased to do that with our colleagues at USAID. Thanks. Any comment from USAID? Yes, thank you, Representative Vargas, for that question. Uh, just with respect to the dry corridor in Honduras, uh, again, we're, we're very focused on that. We work with thousands of farm families there. Our focus has been on uh, improving water management, uh, introducing drip irrigation, diversifying crops, and helping farmers gr uh, grow crops that have a better, op uh, uh, better market opportunities. Uh, and we combine that with um, nutritional intervention so that families have a better diet. Uh, and again, we, we've just, going back to the issue of measuring, uh, when, we, uh, when we survey uh, a, a sample of those farmers and their families, uh, they are 70% less likely, they tell us they're 78% less likely to migrate uh, as they see these improvements in their situation than, um, uh, uh, than the national average uh, of, of uh, Hondurans. So that's just one example of the kind of work we're doing in the dry corridor. Thank you. Thank you. And I just, just to conclude, I, I want to thank Mr. Zuniga for mentioning La UCA. La UCA is the Universidad Centro América Simón Cañas. They were, my, they were my superiors when I was there, and the director there was Ignacio Yacuria, one of the Jesuits who were murdered. They're great people, um, and thank you for working with them. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Congressman. We now recognize Scott Perry, Congressman Scott Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak this morning, uh, and congratulations to Mr. Zuniga. Uh, and for many Americans, 
what seems to be happening or what they believe right now is happening is uh, what appears to them is we're replacing national born American, native born Americans per to permanently transform the political landscape of this very nation. Um, the president's policies have led to li nearly 19,000, 19,000 un unaccompanied minors being apprehended last month. That's a 100 percent increase from February. A 2017 survey conducted by Doctors Without Borders indicates that nearly one-third of all girls and women were sexually abused during their journey to the United States. Um, that, that, that's, that is staggering to me. That is staggering to me. Be, because of this, the Biden-Harris administration's immigration initiatives that actually encourage disregard for our law, laws, border tra traffickers reportedly made 14 to 15 million dollars a day. I don't know which one it is, but it's a whole lot of money. And, and, and we're encouraging that. We're aiding and abetting that. I find that completely unacceptable. The human and drug trafficking are a twofold scourge on our nation and this administration's negligence in confronting the exploitation of children, of children. It's disgusting, untenable, unacceptable, and in complete contradiction of our values. Now, this administration is proposing taxpayers now pay billions to Central America to stem this tide. While we're talking about re resources, let's just talk about what a Border Patrol agent would tell you if you ask them what they need, what they're looking for to do their job, to protect our country. That's a border wall. On day one of this presidency, this president stopped wall construction, which had an estimated cost of two to three billion dollars to terminate all the construction contracts. Look, whether this four billion dollars or whatever it's going to be is meaningful and successful or not is immaterial to the fact that we just threw two to three billion dollars away for something that does in some effect work. Not completely. It's in, it's in concert with other things. We just threw that money away. The sad truth is, is that Border officials encountered 172,000 migrants last month, which is 10 times the figure from April in 2020. I, I disagree with my good friend from, from San Diego that this isn't a problem and this doesn't happen before. Let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Zuniga. Does this administration consider Mexico an unsafe country? Mexico, uh, as the authorities in Mexico themselves would tell you, has to contend with a very high level uh, of violence uh, and insecurity. In fact, they dedicate significant resources uh, to contending with uh, precisely that. So does, does that mean the administration, do you consider Mexico an unsafe country? Mexico has to contend with... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm using the, the term unsafe country because, as you probably know, it's definitional regarding policy. So... Unsafe or not? I mean, I know you. I know I keep saying it, but I'm trying to figure out if you're going to say it's unsafe or not. Representative Perry, uh, Mexico has areas that are safe and areas that are not. Uh, <laughs> it is a large country, and, and there are areas, <clears throat> excuse me, that are particularly vulnerable to transnational organized crime. The foreign minister in September of 2019. Ebrard stated that the trend is irreversible, that we didn't need a safe third party agreement with Mexico because there were less and less people going to the border. Due to policy, by the way, due to policy, but he said the trend is irreversible, so we don't need a safe third party agreement, which goes to unsafe or safe. You're saying it's, well, you're not saying anything. You won't, you'll say some of it's safe, some of it's unsafe. For the point that it's unsafe, I would ask you, why are we allowing hundreds of foreign nationals from this unsafe country to come into an America? And I'm sure you know over th a thousand uh, of, of people that came in just last month convicted of assault, battery, domestic violence, burglary, robbery, theft, drug per possession and trafficking, sexual offenses, some on the, on, on the, on the terrorism watch list. Why would we allow that? And if it's, and if it's not unsafe, and if it is a safe country, then why aren't we enforcing the international standard that refugees who seek asylum in the first safe country, why aren't they doing that in Mexico? And I would just ask you one or the other. So, Representative uh, Perry, uh, number one, the 
administration is committed to enforcing U.S. law and to securing the border. Uh, second, uh, as has been noted, the United States has dedicated resources uh, and worked with Mexican authorities and international organizations to reinforce the ability of Mexican authorities and others to provide security in Mexico and to provide security for those who are in vulnerable situations. So uh, improving protection capacity, not just in Mexico, but in Central America as a whole, is part of the Biden administration's policy uh, towards Central America. I yield back. It ain't working, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs, to recognize for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for letting me participate in this subcommittee hearing. I would first like to just associate myself with the comments of my fellow San Diegan, Representative Vargas, about the situation we have in San Diego, and welcome any of my colleagues who would like to come visit us and, and see. Um, to our witnesses, thank you for joining us. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about violence reduction. Uh, you both mentioned in your testimony how important violence was as a push factor. Uh, and we know that gang violence is distinct from other forms of conflict, but also has a lot of similarities. So I was just wondering if you both could talk about what you're doing to address violence and what we've learned from other efforts to address violence and conflict uh, in the region. I'll speak briefly, but my, my colleague uh, from USAID uh, has direct experience in El Salvador where we've been uh, managed many of those. I would say uh, we have actually learned quite a bit over the last few years about how to deal with uh, what is a very deeply embedded social violence in the case of uh, gang violence. It's not just uh, in the case of homicides, which have come down significantly, uh, but also in what people experience in daily life in, in terms of insecurity and their perception of insecurity. That changes behavior, and it changes the sense of when people feel like they can make their lives at home. Uh, what we found that there, is that there are interventions that are particularly effective, uh, and they are not uh, always, uh, uh, at first glance, what would be popular in communities that have been racked by violence, but uh, interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy, not just with uh, perpetrators, but with their families and who, people who are their victims, uh, is particularly effective over time. One thing that we found is that uh, one of the real challenges of gangs, not just in Central America, but, uh, but in many other places, is an inability of people to leave that life. Uh, and so uh, looking at it as a phenomenon, and not just the, the, the crime that happens, but where it comes from, it is an important part of finding ways to contend with it. And we found excellent partners uh, across Central America in helping us deal with this. It is, it is an intensive uh, approach, but it does yield results. There are others as well some involving law enforcement, uh, and that's very important. This is not a, a situation where you can take law enforcement out of the equation. It has to be a part of it. Uh, but there also need to be other interventions. Uh, let me uh, pass this on to my colleague. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Jacobs, for that question. Uh, USAID is very engaged in this space. Uh, and let me talk about how we work at the national level and then come down to the community levels. At the national level, we, uh, we do a lot of work to uh, collect data and evidence on what kind of crimes are occurring and where they're occurring. We share that data. We, bring, we use that data to bring together policymakers from the three countries so that they can make smarter policies that address violence. That's at the national level. We share those, those, uh, that data with mayors uh, in, in the most dangerous municipalities. And then we work closely with those mayors, with local leaders in those municipalities, uh, to focus even at the neighborhood level. Uh, to uh, uh, build community centers, after-school programs for kids, uh, the kind of uh, 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 therapy programs that the special envoy mentioned when we, when we find at-risk families, right? Um, and uh, it, it's, I think it's important to note that over time, uh, uh, the murder rates in the three countries have gone down considerably. Um, I think in 2013 in El Salvador, the murder rate was 100, 103 people per 100,000 citizens. I think today, I think in 2018, it came down to 52, and I think today it's, it's even much lower. So we're seeing impact, we're seeing positive impacts in that space. Um, and then another key thing that we do as part of these efforts is to take back territorial control from the gangs and from the violent actors. One quick example there, the, uh, the, the Cuscatlan Park in the city center of San Salvador, really an emblematic park for that country, was overrun by gangs and violence. We work with the mayor, we work with uh, community leaders, we work with the private sector to take that park back, 
There were 70,000 visitors to that park over the course of the uh, uh, three months prior to COVID. And I think about 90% of those people said they feel safe in that park. That's an example of taking space back for citizens so they, they, they could be with their families, they could recreate their communities, and they can envision a better future. Well, thank you for that work and, and the progress. In my last couple of seconds, uh, Mr. Natiello, I was just hoping you could talk about the Partnership for Growth model, if you're planning on bringing it back, or if there are any lessons you're taking from that program to how you're operating in these countries now. Uh, so I, on the Partnership for Growth, I'd say that um, you know, we're, we will uh, implement the policies of the Biden administration. And uh, certainly uh, economic growth is critical to address the kind of problems that we've discussed here today. USAID is very engaged with private sector partners and with governments to try to create economic opportunities in these three countries. We've had some success, uh, but uh, as many have said, this is a long-term challenge that requires us to continue to look for those private sector partnerships build those conditions for private investment so that the jobs can be created, particularly for young people in these countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to our witnesses and the members for joining us for this important hearing. Stemming the flow of irregular migration from Central America will require long-term commitment from the United States to deepen our diplomatic and foreign assistance efforts. I look forward to working closely with my colleagues and the Biden administration to help foster the necessary political and economic condition whereby citizens through the region can imagine a future in their home country. With that, the committee is adjourned. This meeting is no longer being recorded.